for the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for more updates. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Bravey. On Talking Point today, we're looking at the BRICS Summit, its outcomes, the conversations with Ambassador P.S. Raghavan, the chairperson of the National Security Advisory Board. Ambassador Raghavan, really appreciate your time. Great pleasure to be with you again. Pleasure to come here. As I know how busy you are, but just before we get to the outcomes in BRICS, everybody's eyes on what would happen with China and India. We've seen the statements from both sides about the conversation. Your reading of uh, where we are. Well, I think it's very good news that this conversation has restarted between India and China. And the fact that it has restarted presupposes that conditions have been met which permitted India, basically, to resume the conversation with China. And that is very good news. And and all that you can say from the joint statement, not joint statement, I'm sorry, the statements that emerged from each of the two sides is that they're optimistic about progress likely to be made. I, that's about all that one can say, actually, reading from the statements at the moment. In the run-up, you had the commanders' conference, major generals' meeting. There was a lot of expectation, at least in the media. I don't know whether it was justified or not. Subsequently, if needed, in, if you look at both those statements, both leaders have directed the relevant officials to expedite matters to, if needed, there are possibly two other occasions in early September when uh, the two leaders could meet again, whether it's uh, in Indonesia and soon after that, G20. Absolutely. There are these opportunities, and as you say, the opportunities will depend on the progress that the officials make in taking things forward. I mean, India has made it very clear what it wants and how. what are the basis for a conversation that we have with China. And hopefully, if these conditions are met and if the uh, discussions progress well with the officials, you can look forward to seeing some uh, another meeting of the leaders. But as I said, it depends on the progress made. BRICS itself, Ambassador, now there are a lot of views across the globe on what exactly it is, what it's emerging as. It's been described as a China or Russia-led front, a front uh, or a grouping led by the second competing bloc in Cold War 2.0. And there are various uh, uh, analysis of that. BRICS itself and its relevance in the new world order, Ambassador. Yeah, a lot of things have been said about BRICS. And by the way, a lot of things have been said about BRICS from the time that it emerged in 2009. Uh, and we must remember, when it emerged in 2009, its fundamental objective was to promote uh, uh, the, the accommodation of these countries of BRIC initially and BRICS after that in a more democratized economic and financial architecture of the world. That was what BRICS began as. Then, you know, by the time you reach the 2012 summit in Delhi, it sort of acquired a political character. Soon thereafter, you know, things fell apart. The international environment changed. Uh, U.S.-Russia relations went into free fall. Uh, U.S.-China tensions began. India-China tensions arose. So the political character of BRICS actually started sort of uh, uh, constrained, getting constrained from that time onwards. What you're seeing today is a new facet of BRICS. You are looking at, you know, these six countries that were included in BRICS. What does it mean? The six countries are six of 22 who had applied with another 20 waiting in the wings. You might call it a virtual stampede to join BRICS. So you, you the question, it's a good question, what is BRICS today? Why is there this stampede? There is this theory that uh, the Western press talks about it all the time that, you know, BRICS is a counter. That's what you were hinting in your question as well that it is a counter to the G7 or a counter to the US-led international order. I don't think you should look at it as any of that. If at all, it is a body whose members are looking for greater accommodation of their interests in the current world order. They see the world moving towards some kind of a bipolarity. And that is not something that 
many countries of the world want, including India. You don't want to be caught in a bipolar world which constrains your political freedom of action just like it happened during the Cold War. You don't want it to constrain your economic freedom of action. Uh, you want it, you don't want it to constrain your development and growth. So if you see what the, the, this, this whole application of so many people to join BRICS, the idea, I think, is to sort of find shelter in a body that can enable countries to hedge against bipolarity. That doesn't look like a Russia or China-led organization. It is, the, And if you look at it, look at the countries that have joined the uh, BRICS now, Saudi Arabia and UAE, who are basically U.S. allies, uh, they're not looking to... to uh, disrupt the global uh, order or the US-led global order. So, essentially, it is a, an expression of concern at the way in which the global order is going or the global disorder is growing. And then, then trying to see how to find your place in that. In BRICS operates on consensus, the six countries that you mentioned. Not only are they Saudi Arabia, UAE, US partners and allies, the, the great partners with India, all, all six of them. But the process itself, why not certain countries, say, why not Indonesia, why not Nigeria? Yeah, well, we don't as yet know what was the process right. that led to the uh, inclusion. Right. We do know that there was consensus because without that it could not have yeah. happened. And from that composition, we do know that, uh, you know, India should be happy with it. As you said, India has good relations with all of them. Why not Nigeria? Why not Indonesia? We have to wait to see. I am particularly surprised, I must confess, about the absence of Indonesia in this uh, uh, in, in this first list. I mean, it has been indicated that there will be further lists, but Indonesia, actually from all uh, parameters, I think, uh, merited entry into this uh, organization. It is the fourth largest country in the world by, in terms of population. India has excellent rela relations with it. In Southeast Asia, it's a very significant power. And its president was there in uh, Johannesburg as well. So I don't know why Indonesia was not included. I don't know what the dynamics behind it was. I'm sure that uh, in any future expansion, Indonesia would be uh, very much uh, in, in con uh, contention for it. In line of what earlier we were talking about, certain analysts who look at it as a China-led front and why is India there? The other question that was raised constantly, at least in the media, is of de-dollarization, looking for a BRICS currency, yuan replacing that of the foreign secretary, at least made it clear during his uh, briefing after the summit, that what India has been doing, and not just of late, uh, which is the UAE deal, is looking for uh, national currencies to be used in, yes. in transactions. It's not a common currency, so as to speak. Absolutely. You know, I think the idea of a common currency is uh, really not realistic. Uh, it requires a, a, a level of, it requires a level of integration. It requires a level of financial architecture, none of which exists. But trade in national currencies is something, as you know, that has been something that's been talked about for a long time. It has been implemented in various cases. Uh, the Chinese in particular have used it with a number of countries. India has also used it with a number of countries at various points of time. Uh, and in fact, if you look at it, in, even as far back as in the 2012 BRICS summit in Delhi, mm. some facilities were created for back-to-back -back LCs between BRICS countries which would enable, which would actually facilitate trade in national currencies between BRICS countries. So that is something that I think has already started, will go forward. De-dollarization, again, you know, de-dollarization is a rather fanciful expression as of today. Dollar is the global reserve currency and that is not going to change. However, there are people now nibbling at the edges of this system. When you start seeing Saudi Arabia or UAE uh, designate their oil in yuan, now that is actually nibbling at the edges of the superiority of the dollar. But from that to say that you're going to de-dollarize the global economy, I think it's a far cry. Again, just if you look at the big picture from BRICS and the outcomes that were announced, it was 26 pages, the joint 
<laughs> the declaration in terms of deliver deliverables or at least the progress towards deliverables the voice of the global south uh, that uh, india is projecting itself as and china has its own economic inroads in the global south is that a competition that is playing out while at the same time there is collaboration happening in the sense that there's consensus happening in brics see if there is a competition for the affections of the global south <laughs> that competition is not taking place in brics if there is a competition it would take place outside brics the brics really in that sense does not produce deliverables in its joint statement if you look at the joint statement you said it's 26 pages it is many 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 paragraphs much of it is actually restating of positions that countries have and as i said before you know as the international environment has changed the commonalities of approach of the brics countries uh, has actually reduced so the brics statements i mean this may be blasphemy but the brics statements effectively are uh, good drafting papering uh, trying to find the commonalities that exist and highlighting them and papering over the dis the, the, the differences between the countries so as to produce a document that actually covers all international issues of the day so and you can see that you can see that in in various areas of uh, on africa on issues of you know libya and syria and so on they have agreement and they have stated that agreement very clearly on ukraine they say that we stated out in country positions Mm. and that we want peace so you know you know it's a far more diluted uh, reference there so i think in brics one should not be looking at the statement to find deliverables the fact that they produced a statement the fact that they have found the maturity to reach consensus on drafting a document is i think sufficient progress within brics and that's going to be an even greater achievement when you have six more countries <laughs> what added to it i was just going to ask yeah, you and the brics today more than doubled its membership subsequently when it it becomes bigger and bigger what happens to the name and that that's a million dollar question but now that is of course one well, thing that again okay, when you're looking at uh, uh, what the prime minister talked about and that was time very aptly with the chandrayaan uh, mission successful mission about this space consortium now the uae anyway has great uh, space prowess how do you see that uh, moving in terms of the global south and how india can help because the chinese have a very different space kind of program well look uh, development applications of space is something that india has had considerable experience in more than most of the others even the space bearing space faring countries so uh, it is possible to set up uh collaborations in various particularly developmental aspects of space and now that we have let our private sector into space the opportunities the, there are much broader opportunities for cooperation in space and i'm sure that will also play itself out you know one of the things that brics has achieved in recent over recent years is increased intra brics cooperation on a number of socio economic areas and i think that provides promise rather than vast declaratory statements on the global scene so you know you have the new development bank and you have the intra brics cooperation these are two flourishing aspects of brics cooperation that's the other one the new development bank i think we should talk about where where well, it it has been really one of the successes of brics and the fact that new members have been inducted would increase its capital base and it may be widen the range of projects that it uh, finances and that is another cementing factor in brics which is non political in nature ambassador agon again absolute pleasure of having you on strat news global and again we thank you a lot for your time in an extremely busy schedule thank you thank you very much it's great to be with you again thanks And for our viewers, do give us feedback about this interview. Do follow all our social media handles for the latest that we put up. Articles on our website or interviews like this with the Master P S Raghavan on our YouTube channel. This is the Talking Point on Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Ravi.